You know, I don't know how would I, how would I like if I just wanted to say welcome or hello. How, what would be a good way to sign that way? You would just say hello. Oh, hello, just like yeah. That. Okay. So goodbye is that, and hello is sort of your your palm uh, sort of outstretched. Okay. Yeah. And is there like a polite way, you know, in Arabic, you were saying, you know, tashrafna or something like that? Is there a nice way to say, you know, nice to meet you or? Oh yeah, you know? absolutely. This is nice. Nice. Okay. Nice, and then meet. <gasps> meet. Okay. That's two people coming together, uh, uh, and then you point at you. Did you ever happen to learn the word for embassy? <laughs> Welcome to our latest edition of our English language podcast from the U.S. Embassy in Amman. I am joined today by Pearl Pap, who's going to help me learn about uh, the very interesting world of deaf culture. Welcome, Pearl. Thank you, Dan. So it should be obvious that uh, you don't have any particular hearing Im impediment that's obvious. Um, but tell us a little bit about your connection to the deaf world. You bet. So um, I am what you call a CODA, a child of deaf adults. Uh, my mom and dad are both deaf. My father was born hearing, and my mother was also born hearing. And at the age of five, my father contracted spinal meningitis. Mm. This was all taking place in Budapest, Hungary. Mm. And uh, he became deaf as a result of the meningitis. He fell into a coma for three days, and when he awoke, he could neither walk nor could he speak or hear, and he regained his ability to walk, but he never actually learned to, or never regained his hearing. My mother, on the other hand, was born hearing, as well as her sister Georgina, the two eldest of seven children, and uh, both girls were age three and two, respectively, when they both contracted a fever. We think it was scarlet fever, but the history is a little fuzzy in the family. Uh, both girls became very ill over a period of a few weeks. They lost their hearing, and they never regained it as the fever subsided. And so out of the seven kids on my mom's side of the family, the two eldest girls are deaf, and the other five siblings were all born hearing and are still hearing. So my parents met and uh, at deaf school, or at a class for deaf kids, and they had my sister and myself. My sister's four years older, and both Rosemary and I can hear completely fluently. If I'm not mistaken, I think hereditarily deafness, or deafness um, passes hereditarily, only about 10% of cases. So 90% of folks who are deaf, from what I understand from research, is through some sort of an illness. So as a child of deaf parents, you're part of a kind of a, a very exclusive club. Uh, as I understand, it includes some very famous people um, who are, are kids who have parents that are deaf, at least one, one of their parents. I, I think it includes people like um, Alexander Graham Bell right. um, and then uh, some of our Hollywood stars, uh, Lon Chaney and, uh, and then Louise Fletcher, who won an Academy Award. So what were some of the challenges or I guess um, interesting experiences about uh, being a hearing child in, in, a, in a deaf world? Well, I think I'll talk a little bit first about the the sort of challenges, but then ultimately it all sort of comes back to some positivity because I really have, like love the way I grew up and don't know any other way to, to have, have grow, having grown up. So a couple of the challenges were, um, I remember on the first day of school every year, my father would take me to the principal's office or to the secretary's office and announce that um, if I was sick or needed a day off, I was allowed to call myself in. And so I remember being five years old, six years old, saying hi, and I would be signing for my dad and telling all the teachers and administrators, I get to call myself in. So this was a bit of a challenge as a young child, but of course in high school you can only imagine how I took advantage of that. <laughs> uh, so that was one story. And then... Um, and then another thing that a lot of children of deaf adults go through is we become the interpreters and the translators on behalf of our parents to the rest of the world. So what this does is this makes, up, makes us grow up very quickly. An example, I remember, and I grew up in the 80s back home in Denver, Colorado, so I remember I was the one who was calling the bank. I was the one who was calling the phone company, and I was five, six years old when I was making these types of phone calls. Um, my father, he got uh, remarried, he got divorced when I was 14 to my second, um, his second wife, and we didn't have the money to pay for an interpreter, so I got pulled out of school out of the age of 14 for the period of a month to go be his translator with the lawyers and in court talking about alimony, talking about division of assets, uh, because I could fluently sign and I was free <laughs> basically and so that was one of those sort of challenges but the way it sort of um, 
translated into my adulthood is that my sister and I both having been the voices of our parents had absolutely no issues when it came time to go off to college and open up our own bank accounts and sign our own uh, rental agreements with landlords uh, to do our own paperwork to get financial aid those types of things because we were so used to having been our parents sort of personal assistants and these kind of things that uh, we just became very very adept at it and again this was all taking place in the 80s and the 90s uh, before pagers before cell phones my father communicated with just basic handwritten letters and the fax machine was actually a huge sort of thing that we had in our household that helped him communicate now I think it's a completely different ball game with the internet with with cell phones with computers I grew up before all of that so that's one of the challenges well, that's fascinating uh, and uh, for a lot of our viewers who may not have experienced the life in the 1980s like you and I have. Yeah. Um, this might be, seem like it's a, a different planet, um, but the, the change in technology has really made a, a huge difference uh, for everybody, but especially deaf people in terms of texting and having access to, to other other ways of communicating. Yeah, technology has definitely had a huge evolution. When I was growing up, my father's alarm clock was a pager that he put in his sock, and he always had to sleep with socks, so it would vibrate to wake him up. What is what? And a lot of deaf people have lights on the doorbells of our houses so that if you're sitting there and someone rings the doorbell, a light flashes off and on. And so we sort of grew up always with lights. <laughs> uh -huh. um, if you wanted to announce your presence in a room to a deaf person growing up, you would either stomp really hard on the floor to have them feel the vibration, or you would turn a light switch off and on. But you would never walk up behind my mom and dad and tap them on the shoulder. That was a big no-no. <laughs> Does some of this carry over today in, in your in your life? Yes, I was. I remember um, I was at one of my jobs when I was in my early twenties, and I would sort of stand outside my boss's office, just sort of gently tapping on the window, and she would finally see me, and she'd get shocked, and she'd say, "Why don't you just announce you're here, Pearl?" <laughs> and I would say, "I'm so sorry. I'm just so used to organically you sort of seeing me and then paying attention to me." Uh. Another way, it's also sort of um, just the way I sort of act deaf is the whole concept of talking to people in different parts of the house never ever happened in my household so every single conversation had to happen in person and so when I would go to friends houses or even my husband's house and people were yelling at each other from the top floor to the to the ground floor hey did you check the mail today I have no concept of that and even into my adulthood I still carry through with I don't actually sort of yell from other parts of the house I always go right up to someone and speak to them in person uh, in so. my house that would be welcome <laughs> Now, you had mentioned that your parents met in, in, in deaf school, um, but I think you said to me earlier before this interview that your parents had actually very different educational experiences. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, and I just want to preface this with this is just my own family's personal experience. Mm -hmm. So my father was born and raised in Budapest, and the thought, and he was born in 1948. And so he became deaf in the early 50s. And in the early 50s in Hungary, if you weren't completely and totally normal, you were sent to various schools where there were specialized teachers and programs that would teach you. I'm sure they did this with the blind kids and um, with the deaf kids. So my dad was sent to a boarding school for com for all deaf kids um, in a little town called Vats, just northeast of Budapest. And he, he was sent there at five. It was a residential boarding school. And from age five until 18, uh, he was completely educated with the cohort of kids his age uh, who were all deaf with the same group of teachers and they all sort of matriculated together in adult and here's another thing about the Hungarian education that I found until you were in high school you had to sit on your hands as a deaf child and you had to learn how to speak Hungarian and read lips in Hungarian what was the reason for this well think about Hungary in the 1950s and the 60s they were all about integrating and mainstreaming correct like you had to sort of be able to pass and so the way my father was taught was he had to pretend like he was hearing in order to do what in order to get a job and contribute mm -hmm. to society uh, and then to not be different and so my father f and his friends after school this is the story that he and his friends would tell me is they would sign 
sign in Hungarian Sign Language, uh, but in the classrooms they were only able to lip read and speak in Hungarian. Uh, my mother, and I'll come back to that, my mother on the other hand was born in Mexico and then came to America right about the time she got the um, fever. And so from the age of three on, she was educated in San Jose, California. Her family's Mexican and they came as um, migrant workers. Uh, so my mother was placed into a completely hearing school with a deaf unit. Um, San Jose Unified High School. And so that that classroom had maybe five or six people who were deaf, maybe they had Down syndrome, other sort of learning differences with maybe one or two teachers. And so my mother in her adulthood and the cohorts, her friends and folks from San Jose that I've met, um, they sort of went right on social security for disabled individuals at the age of 18. And maybe they got some sort of a job here and there, but for the most part, they were sort of dependent upon public assistance. My father and his friends from Hungary, on the other hand, uh, my father worked for 25 years at Coors Beer Brewing Factory in Denver, Colorado. Uh, he bought three acres of land, hired contractors, hired an architect, built his own 5,000 square foot home. Uh, his other friend, Tibor, he uh, had his own furniture making company. And so I just found that the folks um, in my father's group of friends that grew up and were, were educated at the all um, deaf boarding school, in Budapest, I found them to be a lot more self-sufficient, a lot more confident, and a lot more able to sort of easily navigate jobs and households and incomes. And this was as micro, as immigrants to America. So the, these are all these, Hunga the, I have a whole group, my father has a whole group of Hungarian friends uh, that all went to America in like the late 60s. And uh, they all did very, very well for themselves. This is just my own personal mm -hmm. personal opinion. This was in the 50s and the 60s. I can almost guarantee that things have changed mm -hmm. and improved drastically in terms of education and mainstreaming. Um, but uh, that's definitely the difference I see between the two of them. But, but as a hearing kid of, of deaf parents, you, you continued on. Um, with your own education and higher education, uh, and, and you never really seem to, to separate from the deaf world. Can you, can you tell us about your own educational journey? Yeah, so uh, so when I was in, um, so I went to Berkeley for my undergraduate degree. The and, University of California at Berkeley. Right, well, so my father, yeah, uh, yeah, you, yeah, you see Berkeley. So my father, well, actually, I have a story to tell you about how I got to Denver. So what happened was, is my father came to Hungary when he was 18, and um, his family, the Hungarian family, were part of the refugees that fled the um, occupation by the Russians in 1956 oh, okay. Budapest. Okay. And so his family was absorbed by um, some church group of folks. And so he winds up in San Jose, California, which is where he meets my mom. He's working at a scissor factory in the 1970s, and a bunch of his deaf friends find out that the 1978 American with Disabilities Act is passed, which means certain companies have to hire X percentage of employees who are um, classified as disabled. And so my father um, finds out that Coors Beer is hiring X amount of employees who are deaf to work where? To work in their factories. The reason being is if you go and work in these factory jobs as a hearing person, you'll ultimately lose your hearing. Mm -hmm. And so my father and a group of his friends got jobs at Coors and um, they could use sign language as they were working in the beer plant and the bottle plant uh, and, and get on. So so I was born and raised in Colorado, but I always felt California was my home because I was went there for summers to visit my mom. My parents were, were separated for most of my youth and they got divorced. So I decided to go to UC Berkeley. And at UC Berkeley, we have um, a pretty big presence of Peace Corps recruitment. And I thought to myself, after undergrad, I want to go join the Peace Corps. And um, so I applied in the January of my senior year at Cal. And when the recruiter asked me what I wanted to do, I said, well, I speak sign language. Does Peace Corps have any programs that are established throughout the world where they work with deaf children? And it turns out at that time, this was in the year 2002, Kenya, Nairobi, uh, was the one country that had had an established program. I think they were trying to establish something in Jamaica, but I didn't want to sort of be a trailblazer. I wanted to go right into a program that was established. And so I actually joined the Peace Corps in 2002, and I worked as a teacher to 11 kids in an all-deaf unit um, of a school in uh, the southeast corner of the country. Now, after I did Peace Corps Kenya, I came back to America and thought, well, I worked in the finance industry for a couple years, but I thought, gosh, you know what? I want to go to graduate school, and I want to do social work. Uh, and I thought, where could I go? Well, my uh, fiance at the time was going to SAIS, 
John Hopkins and DuPont Circle in Washington, D.C. Mm-hmm. And I said, well, why don't I try for Gallaudet? So I decided to do my graduate program at Gallaudet, which is, I believe is that time and even now is the only all-deaf university in the United States of America. And that was a such an eye-opening experience. Everyone on the campus speaks sign language. We're talking the security officers at the gate that let you in to everyone at the cafeteria, all the professors, all of the students. You could be in a classroom with a hearing professor and five hearing students. We're all signing to each other. It's deafness with the capital D. There is such a there's such a pro, there's such pride with Gallaudet and being deaf and owning that deafness. And you'll find that all the shops and all the restaurants around um, Gallaudet, which is on Florida Avenue Northeast, mm-hmm. they all speak sign language to a certain degree. Um, the landlords all know a little bit of sign language, so it's this little sort of haven of um, pro deafness within the within the country's capital. And uh, how I felt being at that particular university was. So there's varying sort of echelons within the deaf community. And I, as a child of deaf adult, was sort of kind of at a separate level of this sort of echelon, and I'll explain to you to, it to you like this. You've got some folks who are deaf and they're genetically deaf for generations and generations and generations. Mm-hmm. I had one girlfriend named Cookie who was born hearing but became deaf at the age of 13 because in her family, um, the deafness comes on at puberty. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and she would always say that it wasn't until she finally became deaf that she felt part of her family. And then you have a lot of deaf folks who only sort of want their children to marry other people from the deaf community, and we're talking hereditary deafness. And so for me, I I would go to school and I had these friendships and I could speak the sign language, but I was sort of always one foot in the hearing world and then one foot in the deaf world due to my experience with my parents. So I sort of toggled both. And I kind of, but I definitely felt more more comfortable um, with the deaf folks. I'll tell you another story. When I was at when I was at Berkeley, you know how the first couple of weeks of uh, the fall semester, all of the different um, affinity groups are tabling on campus, and you can decide which one you're going to go join. I remember I saw some 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 groups. I saw like the Hispanic group, and I'm half Mexican. I thought, well, gosh, let me go check out that table. And I quickly saw the Disabled Students Union group, and I thought, gosh, let me go over there. Maybe there's some deaf students I can meet. And sure enough, I got to meet a couple of international um some I got to meet one girl from China who um who was deaf and she and I became really good friends so I actually joined the disabled student union and my connection was the fact that my mom and dad were deaf and we had kids with cerebral palsy uh you know, people in wheelchairs, quadriplegia, that type of thing, blindness, the whole nine. And all of us would go out a couple times a month and go to a dinner and just have fun and just talk about our experiences of how to navigate the campus. <laughs> I, I love that story uh, because, you know, there are a lot of international students uh, that go to the U.S., yeah, especially coming here from Jordan. And there's this concern, like, well, will I find a home? Will I find a community of friends if I go to any American university? And, and I think it's just true with almost every uh, American college, no matter how small or how, how big the university is, that there's a, there's a home, there's a place, and there's a, a kind of an open and welcoming atmosphere in a lot of places. Uh, but a place like Gallaudet Data is, is very interesting because it's, uh, you know, it's, it's really not, it's not completely unique in the world, but it's, it's one of the very few places where, you, as you said, there's actually nothing but a deaf community, and, and that's the predominant community, um, which is fascinating. Um, now, I have to ask this question uh, I, because, uh, w- you know, we at the, at the embassy have been working hard to integrate more um, sign language interpretation into our programs as, as a nod of respect to our deaf audiences here in Jordan, but also as a signal that, you know, all of our work should be accessible as, as much as possible. So, yeah. you know, this interview, we'll have a, we'll have a, a text uh, subtitle version of this in English and in Arabic as well. Um, And when we do live events, we're increasingly trying to use sign language interpreters. And so I learned uh, something um, that uh, uh, a a few weeks ago, we we put together a program and we used uh, a sign language interpreter who spoke Levantine Arabic sign language. And I had no idea that there is. So I guess, uh, you know, for somebody like me who doesn't know very much about sign language. um, So maybe you could talk us through the basics of, of, of what it is and you know, is there a difference between lip reading and sign language and body language? 
and and are there different kinds of sign language um, in, in the world? Yeah, I'll definitely talk a little bit about that. So my experience with sign language is so organic because I was taught basically by two immigrants uh, who my mom grew up speaking Spanish, became deaf, learned American Sign Language. My father grew up speaking and signing Hungarian Sign Language, came to America, learned American Sign Language. So the language we spoke at home was American Sign Language accompanied by written English. And the first experience I had with different sign languages was when I was 16, 17 years old, and a Hungarian folk company came to Denver to, per to perform dances. And my father took me down to the Civic Center in Denver. We saw the performance, and uh, we got to go meet some of the dancers backstage. And the dancers are all hearing, and they only spoke Hungarian. And that was the first time in my life I'd ever seen my father utilize the tools he gained while at school in in Vats, which was he could speak Hungarian almost like a hearing person and he could lip read Hungarian with the dancer and here I was just able to use American sign in English and so my father the deaf man became the translator between the two hearing people and watching my father sign in Hungarian uh, actually he didn't even sign in Hungarian he just spoke in Hungarian mm -hmm. was really honestly the first time in my life I'd ever I'd ever I'd ever heard that or seen it because none of my father's Hungarian friends ever really came around when I was in high school they came around a lot later um, mm -hmm. when I was in my 20s uh, and so I had such culture shock. It must have been the culture shock that a lot of people feel when they see any deaf person signing. They see it and it just looks so exotic. I grew up my entire life, 16 years with this man speaking with him. He taught me my first word um, in American Sign and to watch him speaking in Hungarian was a complete and total um, culture shock. And then later on, when I would see him signing with his Hungarian friends, uh, my sister and I would just sit there completely dumbfounded and perplexed. There's like no similarities between the two languages at all. Fast forward to myself just being a world traveler, I did a study abroad program through Berkeley in Brazil, and I was waiting for a tram to take me up to Pão de Sucar, right, the little sugar loaf, mm -hmm. and I saw some people, some Brazilians signing, and there's more similarities between Brazilian sign and American sign than there are with Hungarian sign and American sign. Mm -hmm. We share the same alphabet, and uh, so I was able to actually um, chat with these deaf people in Brazil, um, and basically Brazilian sign using what I knew of American sign. Then I went to Kenya to serve in the Peace Corps, and the Kenyan sign, it's a little bit more similar to American sign. It's a very new sign, uh, but it was also very different. And then I watched a movie, Four Weddings and a Funeral, with Hugh Grant. Hugh Grant's character is deaf, and the whole movie takes place in England. He's signing in British sign. I can't understand that at all. That is the most foreign sign to me. So the idea that we're both speaking English but using these completely different sign languages is such a commentary on the way I personally sort of view sign language as evolving where I think sign language is such a commentary on the culture of the people. Um, and I think the biggest part of sign language is just these sort of cultural um, movements. So I'll give you a really good example that I used to always think about with my father when I would explain this to people sort of throughout my life. If you think about America and you think about the expansion towards the Pacific from the Atlantic and manifest destiny, mm -hmm. you think of the trains and the laying of the tracks as being the reason why America sort of went from coast to coast. And so in American sign language, the sign for train is is this it's literally the laying of the tracks if you can uh, visualize uh -huh, that uh -huh. do you see that yeah now if you want to know the sign for train in hungary where there was not that sense of manifest destiny because it's such an old old you know european culture this is the sign uh -huh. for train and this you can physically see the train moving and it was just those two examples growing up where I thought you know sign language gosh if there's any sort of um, linguistic sort of uh, you know definer of, of a culture look at sign language because they really sort of encapsulate what the culture is is all about at that time that the signs are actually established I, I mean I think it one of the most remarkable pieces of trivia in the world is as you're mentioning that British uh, sign language and American sign language aren't aren't the same and I think it has something to do with Mr. Gallaudet, the, the the namesake of the university, that he he learned uh, 
his initial um, sign from the French system. Yep. Is that right? That's okay. Yes, the French mm. are the pioneers of sign. And mm -hmm. this I will say, uh, the French sign is the most similar to American sign. So I believe that American sign is almost identical to French sign. I'm sure there's very few differences. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But you're right, it's a, it's a remarkable commentary on culture, too, to see how, how different people use different communication techniques to uh, to express themselves and, you know. Yeah, and I'll tell you, when I went to Gallaudet, which is on the East Coast, it turns out I spoke West Coast sign. So within America, we have different, yes, so I'm just remembering this. Yeah. I remember when I first got there, I was speaking sign language. People said, are you from California? Where are you from? Are you from California? I said, yes, because people could actually see I sort of had these accents and these punctuations and these, uh, I don't even know what the word is for it, but um, but I, they could all tell that I spoke West Coast versus uh -huh. East Coast sign. So you can tell a Southerner from a Californian from a New Yorker? <laughs> this is <gr> <laughs> It's just like verbal. It's just, just like dialects. Yeah. Now, with all of that, is there something that is universal to, to deaf culture um, that you would say kind of unifies um, everybody regardless of which, which uh, sign language system they use or what their experience is? I thought a lot about this question, and I'll tell you why. I actually had a friend at, at, at Berkeley who um, taught and spoke Esperanto. Esperanto. And I took her class just for fun. Cause what, it's, no, what's in Esperanto for our audience? Oh, Esperanto. It's Esperanto is this manufactured language that came about very recently, and it's supposed to be the universal language. There's mm -hmm. this whole cadre of people throughout the world that actually speak Esperanto. And so I sat, she taught a class, so I took her class just learning about this spoken universal language, and, uh, and I thought to myself, this would never fly in sign language. Sign language... A lot of folks thought sign language was universal. It's it's anything but. I mean, I could drive from New York to Canada and see two different kinds of signs <laughs> with the with the Canadians. It's so different. Um, I don't even think there. I've I've been to Brazil. I've studied in Mexico. I've lived in Kenya, in America, and I've seen British television. I haven't seen one single sign that is universal. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think the beauty about the sign language that it's so culturally specific. Mm -hmm. uh, I couldn't even say if like I went to Japan, if I were to say hi, maybe that would be hi, but I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. Well, it, it reminds me uh, when I studied, I took a communication theory in, in university at one time and there was a big debate whether or not there is some universal grammar to communication. Well, you know, if we all kind of thought about it really hard, we'd come up with the same language or the same way of talking. Uh, but the counterpoint has always been sign language that, you know, here in real life, people have had to figure out how to communicate because of, uh, you know, of, of, of the challenge of the day. And, and everybody chooses to pull from their, their own place and then their own culture, their own family and, and figure it out from there, which is a, a very nice metaphor, I think, for, for, for all of humanity. Um, so uh, now one thing, just as we're closing out, maybe, uh, maybe for folks that haven't, uh, who aren't used to interacting very much with deaf people, uh, maybe would you have any tips that you could offer folks? Uh, yeah, I actually have a really interesting story that happened once with my mom, with my mother that really sort of alarmed me about the lack of awareness for for deaf folks. My mother um, was living in San Francisco, and this was like ten years ago, and uh, she wound up getting really ill and wound up in the emergency room at just a basic university hospital in San Francisco. And I got a phone call from a nurse at mid at, at midnight saying, "Hi, your mother is here." she's deaf and we don't understand what's wrong we don't understand what she needs mm. can you please come down and I thought well gosh I'm in San Jose I'm an hour away how sick is she and I just said can you do me a favor and she said yeah and I said can you just grab a piece of paper okay great can you grab a pen great can you write down your questions and she will write them back to you <laughs> <laughs> And, it, and they put me on the phone with the doctor, and I was able to sort of talk them through how to kind of get to the bottom of what was ailing my, my mother. But it was just a moment of where I think when folks are faced with deafness, they sort of clam up. They don't know what to do. They And the thing about folks who are deaf is they almost all can read. And so I would say the best bet is to bring a piece of paper and a, and a pen or WhatsApp or text or anything. You can't just sort of write things down until you can finally start to understand what a deaf person is saying. That's a great tip. Yeah. I also, this is a really interesting story. I actually had an English professor who was blind. And my father at the and my father at the end of each semester, I would invite him to join me for a full day of classes. 
<laughs> and my teachers always said it was okay because he was always flying in from Hungary, mm-hmm. which is where he retired. Mm-hmm. And so it was always fun and special for me to sit in the back of you know the classroom with my dad and sign to him the whole lesson. Um, and I got to do this all through college. And at the end of um, the semester, I actually brought my dad, who's deaf, to meet my blind teacher. And I was sort of interpreting for the, she was talking and I was signing to my father and back and forth. And I asked both of them right then and there, which would you prefer? Would you prefer to be blind or deaf? And it's the first time and the only time in my life I've ever been sort of in the same company of my parents or my dad and a, and a, and a blind person. And my blind teacher, uh, Professor Schulter, she said, I would absolutely die if I couldn't if I couldn't hear how could I hear the birds she was a big bird she was a big bird person Mm -hmm. and she said how could I sit at Thanksgiving dinner and talk how could I hear jokes and she said I would it would be devastating and then I asked my father would you rather be deaf or blind he said I couldn't drive are you what are you asking and so uh, that was and I gosh I was like 21 years old at the time and that was such a moment of our own disabilities are far less frightening than other people's and, and that was just such an eye-opener for me. Oh, that is a beautiful story to close our, our interview. But maybe, maybe could you help me, uh, you know, at least in American Sign Language, perhaps, uh, how, how do you say goodbye? It's, uh, there's a couple ways. Okay. Um, the f- more formal way that I've learned, and again, this is sort of my parents teaching me sign. I've never actually formally studied American Sign. I've studied Kenyan Sign, but not mm-hmm. American Sign, is, um, is goodbye. Goodbye. So this is good and this is bye. Oh, goodbye. Okay. And then another way you can say it is just goodbye. <laughs> goodbye. And this might literally be ASL, which oh, is, right. yeah, right. is goodbye. Yeah, yeah, that's how you say goodbye. And thank you? Thank you is very easy. Ah, totally. Just thank you. So thank you and goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. You're welcome. <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs>